that hymn reminds us of our response to the grace that we see that God offers to us. And we're, we're going through the book of Titus, and we're going to be coming up to, I believe, two of the best passages in the New Testament that are going to show us clearly what the gospel means. And uh, Titus is learning that the gospel changes everything. It changes our life. It changes who we are. It transforms our life and all the relationships that we have in it. And it changes the way we work and the way we live in this world. And that's how uh, the gospel impacts everything that we do. And so many of you may know the story of the uh, mutiny on the bounty. And I want to use it as an illustration this morning to tell you about the, the way that the gospel is meant to transform our culture. Uh, back in the 1700s, a ship set sail from England in 1787 to, the, uh, to go to the South Seas. They were going to take some plants and things with them to create new harvest opportunities for them in the South Seas to provide for people around them. It took them 10 months to travel to that island that they ended up landing on. And then they spent six months there doing the work that they were planning to do. And then they were being called back to England. So they were asked to embark on the ship. And the men who had been there now enjoying uh, six months of time in the South Seas, they loved the, uh, the native women there. They loved the people that were there. They loved the community. They loved the climate. They loved the weather. It's like going on a vacation and never wanting to return. And so that began the mutiny on the bounty. Uh, the men did not want to get back on the ship and go back with Captain Bly. You've seen maybe the two movies that have been made. I think there's even maybe a third. But in the either result, that they uh, set the captain out on a, on a boat and sent him off uh, in order to die. They hoped that would be the case, and they would remain on the island. And so Captain Bly actually made it back. He was rescued and made it back to London, told the story, and then a ship was sent back to go and uh, take care of the mutineers. And so they were then to, uh, hunted down on their islands. And some of them were worried that somehow the English fleet would come back to that island. So a group of them, about nine, left with a few native women and some uh, native men. And they went to an island called Pitcairn in the hopes of being able to evade the English um, vessels that would come back to find them. There was a young man by the name of Alexander <coughs> Smith that was on that trip with him. And over a period of time, they began to, uh, it was sort of like the Lord of the Flies moment on the island, where they were starting to uh, have disease, they were starting to deal with the uh, threat of jealousy and envy, uh, they murdered one another, then it was down to a few women that were left and a few children that had been born from uh, this experience, and then Alexander Smith, who as he was going through the belongings of another uh, sailor, he found a Bible. He had never read the Bible before. He had never known what it had to say. But then as he had a lot of time on that island to think about things, he began to read the scriptures. And through the reading of the word of God, he became a Christian. And he began to teach the women the stories that were in the Bible. He began to teach the children. And they would have daily uh, Bible study. And then they would have a weekly time of worship together. It'd be about 20 years before anyone traveled to Pitcairn Island and found them. And when they did, and when they arrived, they saw uh, the change that had occurred. It was almost like a little utopia in the sense that there was no crime, there were uh, no issues of, of debauchery or the things that they had witnessed in other places before, but they had seen the impact of the gospel through the Bible being the source of that um, life change that was there and how the gospel changed a group of people. And that's really a picture of what God desires his church to be. That we would be a people where the gospel that changes us then changes everything around us. And it looks very different from the world that we live in. And that's why God has called his church to be a model citizen, a model picture of what God desires for his church to be in this world. And so Paul is writing Titus, and he's saying, Titus, I want you to set things in order on this island in the Mediterranean Sea, another location where many people would say, I'd never want to go back uh, to where if you went there for a vacation, you'd enjoy it so much. Uh, but Paul wanted to make sure that the gospel influenced that whole island and that whole region. And that's the power of the gospel. It changes everything about us. It's changed you. It's changed me. 
And then we are able to sing a hymn, may the mind of Jesus be in our hearts, that it would never disappear, that it would be something that we are able to meditate and gravitate to on a regular basis. And then Paul writes uh, these words. So if you have your Bibles with us, turn to chapter two in the book of Titus. We're going through this over the next several weeks. And there's a little card in the lobby. If you're visiting today and it's your first time being here and you would like to see or have a guide to go through the book of Titus, they're there in the lobby for you that outlines everything for us as well. Listen to the word of God as he proclaimed it through Paul to Titus. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. And older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure and working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may be not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men and be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works." And in your teaching, show integrity and dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that we see this morning now invades into our home life. We saw how it has instructed the church how to be organized, and now we see how you desire for us to live within our homes and in our relationships with one another, even in our marriages and our parenting if we have children. So we thank you that your gospel changes everything about us and impacts every arena of life. So Lord, we come before you this morning seeking understanding. We pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would reveal your word to us today showing us areas where we need to continue to be transformed and renewed by your scriptures in our life. And we pray that we would be a church and a people that would live according to your word, just as we heard of an island being changed by the hearing of your word. May you continue to change us and our homes and our community, this city and our world, so that Jesus Christ would be king over every arena of life throughout the world for we know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So use us now to accomplish that here and now, for the power of your kingdom is seen in your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we've been seeing that Titus has been saying that a thriving church is produced by sound doctrine, sound leadership, and sound living. We're going to see that theme running throughout this book, this short little uh, few chapters that are here. God didn't intend our lives to be lived separately, an island to ourselves. There's no Robinson Crusoe kind of adventure here. His design is for us to enjoy the beauty of what God has called his people to, the fellowship of one another. As we gather today corporately, there is joy in being together, knowing that we are part of a team of what God is doing in this world. We're part of his church and his expression. And he desires for us not to be individuals, but to be a collective whole together, and that the Lord would work through us in that way. So if you live your life in isolation, if you live your Christian life in isolation, that's not the design that God had for us. His design is that we would be a community, a beacon of hope, a lighthouse, and together and one another, that we'd be on this journey and we would enjoy and encourage one another. And then you start hearing in the New Testament the one another passages, to love one another, to build up one another, to encourage one another. And that becomes the picture of what God designed in his church, that we would come alongside. So when we wrestle and struggle in our walk, there are others to come around us and to help us. And this is how the picture of the church was seen as a hospital for sinners that the church was the, the place where the people gathered and they bandaged up each other's wounds. They were able to see that it was like a mass unit and the church was seen to be that kind of effect on one another that we would enjoy uh, being in fellowship together. And so some of the Psalms, Psalm 133, how blessed it is for brothers and sisters to dwell in unity. And we see what God holds as a premium. He desires for his church to be a community, to be a loving and encouraging place 
for anyone who comes, whether they're seeking to know God or have also received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we are a church that has open doors in the sense that we desire for people to come, whether they're seeking to know him in the first place or also for us to enjoy what we have and knowing that the grace has touched us. So when Jesus tells the disciples to, in Matthew chapter 28, we call it the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And we forget that last part of the phrase, and what that really meant was that we're to live out the way that God has called us to live. We're to observe, or it's not that we look at it with our eyes, it's that we live it out with our life. And that's what the church does. We live out God's gospel daily. And then our expression of that gospel is a witness to our communities. And then he said, and behold, I'm with you always. I'm going to be there to help you go through this journey. So not only are we part of a community together, but we have God in our midst. Wherever two or three are gathered, he will be there in the presence. And the power of the Holy Spirit is with his church. And the power of the Holy Spirit starts working in our lives, changing us, transforming us, making us radically different than what we were before. And every aspect of who we are gets changed. There's nothing that's left untouched. And so when we begin to think about that and we see what he's called us to do to live in this church, we begin to see that the gospel is our strength for daily living. It's only the ability of the gospel to work in our life to be able to do what God has called us to do. It's not something that we're able to do on our own benefit, on our own actions. There's no self-righteousness included in this gospel that the scriptures Unfold. Last week I proclaimed that whole idea that the gospel is that God saves sinners. He does the work. He changes lives. He takes a heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh, a heart that loves him and enjoys him. And the strength of the Holy Spirit is there. So Paul then lays out a picture of what this life is going to look like in the church between older generations and younger generations. It's going to include every single person. Male and female, old and young. And it's a transforming example that we are to live in this way. And when we live this way, then the watching world will see. So when the sailors arrived on that island, they were able to see that there was something different in all the lives of those that were there, how the gospel had changed them and changed the way they live. And that too is to be the expression of those who watch us and watch the church in the modern day that they should see something different in us when our children are in the public schools. They should notice that there's something different about our children when the gospel has changed them. They should notice something different with our college students who are living as light in the midst of darkness. And they should notice the difference in our workplace. When we go there, they should see something different, that we are a different kind of person because of what the gospel has done. And our bosses and our co-workers notice something different. And in our homes, if the home isn't fully of uh, followers of Jesus Christ, then the people that are there that aren't are able to see what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And we see that rubbing off in the midst of their experience. We're to be an example to the world and our life and the gospel has this transforming impact in what we are doing. And so Paul says this, but as for you, teach what's in accord with the sound doctrine. Now remember, last week we looked at false teaching and we saw the toxic church and how it was a problem. And the people in Crete were sitting there and they were trying, uh, they said that they proclaimed God, but their deeds were not reflective of their relationship to God. So in comparison, Paul is going to say, Titus, look, but for you, this is how you're to live. You're to live according to sound doctrine. And what is sound doctrine? It's the idea of living according to God's word that's laid out in the scriptures. And the word sound meant healthy. So we desire a healthy church. If we want a healthy and thriving church, it's going to be found on living according to the scriptures. It's going to be found in reading the word and studying and preaching the word of God before us. And then he lays out before him, tell the older men this. The older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Now, this list is never to be expected to list everything that we are to do, but in this type of setting, on the island of Crete, this was what was needed from the older men. 
And he wants us to see and have a picture of how the gospel transformed the older men into this. They're to be sober-minded. Again, it's that idea of the absence of alcohol, literally. That's what it meant, the absence of wine. But it was meaning that they were clear-headed. We talked about that when we had the characteristics of being an elder, that they weren't to be addicted to wine. It didn't mean that they couldn't drink wine. It meant that they wouldn't allow wine to pervade so that their minds would be influenced by the wine instead of the mind being influenced by the word of God. So for the older men, make sure that they're sober-minded, that they're clear-headed, they're able to make wise judgments. They're also to be dignified, and this speaks to their reputation, that they're seen by those around them with, a, with honor and respect. And he's writing this about all of the older men that are there on the island of Crete. Make sure that if they're followers of Jesus Christ, this is what their life looks like. They're to be dignified. They're of a good character and worthy of respect. They're also self-controlled, and if I... Uh, if you forgot, I mentioned to you that this is the one uh, characteristic that's seen in everyone. Self-controlled. As I encourage you to read through Titus, I said don't write or underline anything until you've read it for a couple of weeks and then go back. Now I want you to start taking out your pen or your pencil and start circling and, and underlining the words that are repeated over and over again. And you're going to see self-control pop off the page. You're going to see the word sound pop off the page. You're going to see that the Lord uses that over and over again. And self-controlled is one who's able to control their passions and not be blown by the wind here and there like a flag is on a pole. They're self-controlled. They're able to have an orderly life. And then they're sound in faith. Now he's going to talk about their relationship to the Lord. These older men are to be sound in their relationship with God. And how are you in that kind of relationship? As we look at these lists, think about yourself. Think about the characteristics that are in your life. How do they measure whether you're male or female? Listen to the list and let's go through it. And he says, I want you to be sound in faith. I want the older men to be longing for the Lord. And James chapter one says this, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man that looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law of the liberty and abides by it and is not having, and not having become a forget, forgetful hearer but an effectual doer, this man is blessed in what he does. I think that's a good little picture of what it means to be sound in faith that they're doers of the word. They don't just take it in and hear it week by week, but they then are living it out daily, hour by hour. And how are you in relationship to soundness of faith? Is this something that you're practicing, that you're putting in place, that you're trying to live out the very word of God because that's the design he has for us, that we would be doers of his word, not just sitting and soaking it in, but we're releasing the word of God that has come to our minds. If we are a church that's only going to fill our head with doctrine and knowledge, we will not be a thriving church and a church that impacts this city. And we won't be a, a good representation and, and vision of what God desired for his church because when the gospel touches us, it changes the way we live. And so if you look at your life and you see that your life hasn't changed that much since coming to Jesus, then there's something that you need to look at and say, why is that not the case? Because the scriptures tell us that this is what's to happen. This is the fruit of the gospel, that our life would be radically transformed. And when it's not happening in your life, that's when you begin to say, okay, Lord, I don't see that. I don't see the fruit in my life. And we begin to pray, and we begin to dig into the scriptures, and we begin to ask the Lord to have the power of the Holy Spirit come upon us to where we see that change happening in our life. But he wants to make sure that they were sound in faith. And then he says, I want them to be sound in love. So not only are we looking at the relationship between us and God, we now see that the relationship between one another. And the gospel influences the way that we treat one another, the way we live with one another is changed by that. You've heard us say to love God and love neighbor is the summary of the law. 
when Jesus had somebody ask him that question, what does, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And he added on to it, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So we see these two things that Jesus is saying is the pinnacle of his teaching, to love God, a vertical relationship, and to love one another, which is the horizontal relationship. When we have been impacted by the horizontal or vertical relationship of God, where Jesus has died for us, and he's covered us over with his righteousness, it then changes everything horizontally. It changes the way we live with one another. It changes the way I live in my marriage, the way I love my wife and love my children because the gospel has changed me. And it affects the way that I have all of my horizontal living it shows me that I have to be different at work. It shows me that I have to be different in relationships because the gospel, that vertical relationship, has now transformed me in such a way that it changes the way I love, that I should be sound in love. In a world that does not know love the way the scriptures have portrayed it. Think about our communities. Think about our culture. Think about our world and the lack of love for one another. And Jesus is going to say, you will be known as Christians by our love for one another and for our world. And we as Christians sometimes downplay this love thing. We think it's a kind of a little bit different. But listen to how Paul describes it to the people at Corinth. Love is patient and love is kind. I recite this at weddings on a regular occasion. It's not jealous, love does not brag, it's not arrogant, it does not act unbecomingly, love does not create a list of the things that you did wrong and bring them up at the next fight that you have between husband and wife. And we see that so often. It does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, it does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. And it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of the prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. And he emphasizes how love is the, the pinnacle of the fruit of the Spirit for the church. And Paul is saying, Titus, make sure that the older men understand that they're supposed to be sound in love for one another and for God. And then there also to be sound in steadfastness, the idea of perseverance. And boy, our Christian walk, we don't preach enough on perseverance. Through trials and tribulations that we go through, the onslaught of difficulties that come with living in this world, and God calls his church to persevere. And one of the grand doctrines of the Reformation was the perseverance of the saints meaning that they will continue despite all the struggle, all the difficulty, all the challenges in this world because the gospel enables us to persevere, not by our own sheer might and will, but steadfastness and bravely bearing through the trials and afflictions that this world has to offer. Patience and perseverance is much needed in the church and in our lives. And then he moves on to the older women, and he lays it out there for them. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. Reverent in behavior was this idea, a godly demeanor, a, a holiness that was seen in their life. And so the older women are to display that to the watching world. So the Men have been given a list. Now, the list was not complete, meaning everything that you're supposed to do. But on the island of Crete, these were things that Paul wanted to emphasize particularly for them and their situation. We don't know everything about their situation, but we do know that these were things that he wanted them to emphasize in their walk and in their transformation. They're not to be slanderers. Think about our culture that's so easy. Go on to Twitter, go on to any social media today and see how vicious we are with one another. See how easy it is for us to tear down somebody else uh, when we're not in their presence, but we'll do it over a wide uh, format to be able to do so. He said, don't be slanderers. And it's meaning the idea of not talking badly about somebody else. Words that won't divide. 
Slanderers will say things that will divide parties, but the gospel has changed that. The gospel has made us be lovers of people, so slanderers and lovers of people don't go together, right? They're not hand in hand. These are things that are opposite. And so if you're going to be an effective ministry and if you're going to be an effective witness in the world, the church of God shouldn't be a group of people that slander and tear down and divide. My church will be known for their love for one another, but unfortunately, sometimes the message that the church sends is that we're people that like to divide. And we can divide with one another even within our own boundaries, within our own walls. We can tear one another down. We can use it sometimes even in offering prayer for one another where we might disclose something that should have been kept private. But we do that out of saying, well, we want to make sure we're praying for them. We can even use our prayer life to do slanderous work with one another. And Paul is saying, let not that be in the church. Let us not be people who like to see the demise of one another. Let us remember that we're a hospital for sinners that bandage up the wounded. We don't wound our own. A doctor isn't one who comes and does more harm. A doctor is one who prevents more harm. And that's what the church is to do in a watching world. We're to be a people that do not do more harm to a world that's already battered and beaten and destroyed and sees a lack of love, but the church would be one where they love one another and encourage one another and accept one another no matter what background they come from, no matter what color their skin may be, no matter what kind of education they have, no matter how much money they have in the bank or don't have in the bank that the word of God enables us to sit together and to be one with one another because our unity is in Jesus Christ. And so he lays it out for us. The women aren't to be slanderers. And slander comes out of envy and hatred. Certainly not a characteristic of God's people. Then again, he says they're not to be enslaved to much wine. Do you notice that that gets repeated in the qualifications for the elder? Sober-minded for the older men. And now, again, don't allow uh, wine to be enslaved to. Obviously, there was an issue that they had the pro- possibility for alcohol to influence their lives in such a way that it would tear their relationships apart. And we live in a culture that sees that now. I was on the board for a substance abuse clinic in Rock Hill where I used to live and I saw the damage of what alcohol and addiction to alcohol did and how it tore apart families, how it tore apart relationships. And I think most of us can know or have people possibly in our own families that have struggled with that and I've had some relatives that have fought the fight with alcohol and drink. And so he's saying don't allow that to arise in your life so that it leads you away from being self-controlled. And alcohol can do that. Any addiction can do that. And our pursuit of trying to find solutions through drink or through pills or through medication in some way or form uh, will only lead to greater pain and agony. So he said, I want the older women to be teachers of what is good. You're going to see that word repeated in the book of Titus over and over again, that the Lord desires what is good, what is pure, what is righteous, what is holy. And that becomes our desire and our pursuit, our things that are good for us. They're to give advice to the others, to the younger ones, to encourage others. They teach by example what is good. And so they teach against what the false teachers, remember the false teachers in Crete were destroying whole households. They were turning homes upside down, and Paul is saying not for those who are following Jesus Christ. Our speech and our homes are going to be models to the watching world. And then he goes on to say this, and well, remember what the Cretans were, if you remember the philosopher that was quoted by Paul, they were liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So they didn't like to work, they were destroying one another, and they were not able to give a strong word for one another. You couldn't trust them with what they said. So that's the picture of what the island of Crete looks like. But when God was planting his church, it was going to be vastly different among them. And so he said, younger women are to love their husbands and children. And the older women were to teach this to their younger women. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their husbands. And that the word of God may not be reviled. 
So again, if you go into a community, if you're buying a new home, you might go into a community where there's a model home on the street. And you go to that open house. Maybe you're going to go do that this afternoon. You're going to walk into a model home. They want to give you a picture of what this home could potentially be. Well, that's really what the church is to be in its community. It's to be a model home for those that are looking to see what this is all about. What is this kingdom of God all about? And they come into the church and they witness what it looks like in that building and in that room and in the lives of the people. And so we're on display every day of our life. And the gospel changes the way we live because of it. And we are a witness. We are evangelists by just living in the watching world. So he gives the instructions about what they're to do with the younger women. They're to love their husbands. Now, Obviously, these are people that were yeah, possibly going to be married. So they obviously, in this situation, it wasn't meaning that all the women were to be married. It's the idea, for those who are married, they're to love their husband. Give them instruction on what to do. Uh, I've counseled many people for their weddings. And so we talk about some of the things that they're going to experience in the first few months of a, of a funeral. Of, I mean, a funeral, of a, of a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> that was not planned, I will promise you that. <laughs> But in the first situation, I even talk about which way are you going to put the toilet paper on the roll on the wall. Is it going to roll from the top or is it going to roll from underneath? Because I've seen fights over which way that's going to be. I've seen fights over which toothpaste are you going to now use. One was a Crest user, another one was Colgate. So which one are you going to do? Are you going to buy separate tubes or are you going to sit there and join in one? And which way are you going to go? And we talked about that sort of thing. So the older women were teaching the younger women what they're to do when they start in a, a marriage situation. I didn't say funeral. In a marriage situation. And then when that man leaves his clothes in a bundle at the foot of the bed and it's wash day. And the wife sometimes says, Hubby, can you, not make, can you make it get to the washing machine on its own? Um, and we begin to see how we struggle in the relationships that can occur between husband and wife in that kind of situation. And to love their children. Because we have homes where the love of children is not visible in homes today in our culture right here in Johnson County. There can be homes that will have people and children living in the midst and they don't know if their mom and dad love them. And everything that they've witnessed has been contrary to it. And we have a problem of child abuse in our culture that's very prevalent. We have a problem of sex trafficking being done through foster parents. Where one of the biggest uh, introductions into the sex trafficking trade is through the foster family situation. In a few weeks' time, we're going to be bringing in, uh, while I'm on vacation, Russ Tuttle, who's the director of Stop Tra uh, Trafficking Project here in KC. And you'll get a taste of what's happening right in our own midst, where children aren't able to see love from a mom and dad. So Paul is going to say, for the church, let the church tell their children that they're loved. Let the church tell their husbands and wives to love one another like Jesus Christ loved it. So when our marriages are on display, they see us being different. And unfortunately, sometimes our marriages are no different than the unchurched. And we can see the struggle in our vertical relationship with God has sometimes been warped to where we might even see abuse between husband and wife. And Paul is saying, make sure you teach the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. It wasn't a message just for the women. It was also for the men, older and younger, that we love one another. And our evidence of our relationship with God would be seen in that love. To allow our church to be a picture of what love truly is, like we just read in Corinthians chapter 13. Then another word he uses is self-control, the same as the older men and the older women. We see this repeated here, and the elders, were, they have this same qualification. Again, it's that idea that they have control of their passions. They're not being blown uh, by the wind in either direction. They're to be pure. It, was not mean, it meant not only chastity in their sexual life, but also purity of heart and mind in their conduct, and that they were to be pure. There are to be workers at home, and so now we get into the two that are often problematic in our 21st culture, 21st century culture, where we think, well, this means that they are only to work in the home. That wasn't the case of what that meant here. But there are to be workers at home. Remember, they were called lazy gluttons in Crete. 
what Paul was addressing was the idleness in the household. And he was saying, at home, be workers at home, that you're not lazy in what you're doing. And that's not only something you would say to wives, he was going to say that to human beings in other passages of Scripture. That we're not to be lazy in our life. And so we are, uh, see that they're workers at home and not idle with their life. They're to be kind, they're upright and worthy of um, respect in the same way they were good and then submissive to their husbands. Probably the, the passage that grates every woman that hears this passage of scripture. And again, what does that mean? And I want to remind you in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul teaches that we're to be mutually submissive to one another. Not only husband and wife, but also in all relationships. In the workplace, we're going to see it in next week's passage in chapter of verse 9 and 10, where the worker is going to be asked to be submissive to the boss. And so Paul is going to use this word again about uh, the relationship that we are, and, and the church is going to be a picture of submission, where Jesus becomes the leader of submission in the sense that he submitted to the Father's will and came and died on our behalf, and he said, we're going to then be people that reflect submission in, in relationships. And Paul is emphasizing here in marriage, there's going to be submission. And he wanted the wives to remember that that's part of being married, submission, as well as it is for the men. So when I train and, and equip people to get married, I talk about this issue of submission and what does it mean? Because we have a warped view of what submission means. I remember uh, having a person come into my office and saying, well, the pastor at my church told me I'm to remain in my marriage when my husband is beating me. And the pastor said to her, that's because it means to submit to your husband. And that is such a warped view of what submission means. For any husband that is verbally abusing, physically abusing their spouse, and if you come to church and you profess Jesus Christ, and that's what you're doing with your fists and with your voice, then how is your relationship with God? How can you even stand in the presence of the Lord and think that that can be compatible and acceptable? And we see Newhouse Domestic Shelter downtown where we are needing a place for women and their children to go because there are some men who believe that they can beat their wives into submission. It's not what the scriptures teach at all. And the model that is given is Jesus Christ. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church. So you see, that's not a compatible relationship. And submission in marriage is vital. It's needed, it's necessary, and a mutual submission to one another. It doesn't mean one is inferior to the other. That is not true in God's eyes. God has created us as male and female. He's created us in our beauty. He sees us equally in that kind of setting. And whenever we have a warped view to think that one is superior to the other, then we have created a problem and not a picture that God desires of his church in this world. There's much more I could say about that, but we'll continue on. And Paul gives this list, and then he says, so that the word of God will not be reviled. So all these characteristics that are laid out are for the purpose so that the word of God, the gospel, his truth, is not reviled by a watching world. So when we don't live the way the scriptures do, we give an excuse to the world to say, look at, look at how phony those Christians are. church is to be a picture of God's beautiful grace and the expression of what God is doing in this world. And we know it's not going to be a perfect church because we're in it and I'm in it. And I'm a sinner just like anyone else and we are in need of grace daily and the power of the gospel daily or we could live just like the world lives. But because the gospel has now entered into my life and changed me, then my life then can be renewed and my love relationship with others, with my children, with my wife can be changed radically whether I'm old or young, male or female, black or white, rich or poor. 
the gospel cuts through all of those barriers that we see in our culture, and it changes and turns the world upside down. So he goes on to tell the younger men, what are they? They're also to be self-controlled. Now, there's only one under the title for younger men. It didn't mean that there wasn't anything for them to learn. It didn't mean that they were further advanced than the others. It was just that this is the situation that he wanted to emphasize for the men that are in Crete, that they need to be self-controlled, that their passions would not rule them, that they would keep them under control. And so this list was not meant to be exhausted. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he said, Therefore be imitators of God and walk in love as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. See, that's what the gospel does to you and me, that we are able to live for one another, to live, to bring glory to the Lord in how we live out our life and our character, our living will be sound as we follow the gospel and we follow the word of God. And that's what will produce a thriving church that will bring people, it will be attractive to our communities, in our schools and in our college campuses, in our dorm rooms and in our workplace. When we just live out the gospel, People will be sitting there and going, why are you so different? How can you live that way in comparison to what I see all around me? That's what God designed his church to do and the impact that it would have on its culture, just like it did on an island in Pitcairn. When the people came and witnessed, they saw what the gospel had done. May that be true for anyone who visits this church and walks in our doors, that they come into our midst and they say, wow, There's something different there. I'm loved and accepted for who I am because we are people who love anyone because God's loved us. That's what the gospel does. That's what kind of church we need to be at Cornerstone. That's what it means to be a thriving congregation and expression of God in this world. So let's pray.